Hi, my name is Jan Bridget and I'd like to welcome you to session two, Where Does Homophobia Come From? This is part of the online training programme, Homophobia from a Multi-Oppression Perspective. I begin this um, second session by asking participants to think about words and phrases that they have heard used to describe lesbians, gays, homosexuals. Quite often there's silence to that request um, and then gradually people will start shouting out things. But it can get quite embarrassing because I think people are too embarrassed to shout out things that they've actually heard. So then I put up this slide. It's a very long list of words, phrases, things that have been said about lesbians and gays. I leave the slide up for a few, well, a minute or two, and ask people to look at it and identify which word phrases they've never seen before, they've never heard of before. And usually there's one or two phrases there. There's a couple of Asian phrases, hijra and chaka, that a lot of people haven't heard. But on the whole, people have heard the majority of these words and phrases. I then point out to people that we could have similar lists for other press groups. So I could ask people to shout out words, phrases to describe women. And we'd end up with a long list of usually negative words, phrases. The same thing for black and minority ethnic people. The same thing for disabled people, etc. The point is, these negative messages lead on to uh, internalised negative identities for people who belong to oppressed groups. Sometimes that's called a spoiled identity. Whilst for the privileged group, it leads on to an internalised positive identity because most of the words, phrases for the opposite, for men, for white people, etc, etc, are usually positive. We are not born with the, these ideas. Apart from language itself, I ask participants what are the six main institutions that create and perpetuate homophobia and sexism, racism, disabilism, etc. Participants often come up with the first five um, which is religion, the law, education, media and family. But sometimes they stumble at the sixth one, which is medicine. I then go on to show six slides that give a few examples from each of these institutions. Religion, it's a sin. As far as Anglicanism is concerned, homosexual genital acts fall short of the ideal, the ideal being heterosexual marriage. Catholicism, homosexuality is an aberrant deviation. About, I don't know, 15, between 15 and 20 years ago, Late, the late Lord Jakubowicz, he'd heard about some research from America by a guy called Dean Hamer. And Dean Hamer reckoned that we would soon be able to identify the gay gene. In response to this, Lord Jakubowicz said that he would recommend all Jewish women to take a test to find out if the fetus was going to be homosexual and if it proved positive then he would recommend that that fetus was aborted. Similarly, and again a similar amount of years ago, uh, the late Dr Siddiqui, um, who is of Muslim faith, 
publicly called for the elimination of gays. Of course, it's highly unlikely we would get religious people coming out with such homophobic statements nowadays. However, a significant number of MPs in the House of Commons and about a third of peers in the House of Lords voted against um, the same-sex marriage bill when it was recently discussed in Parliament. Medicine, it's a sickness. Some of you might be surprised to realise that homosexuality was not declassified as a sickness in Britain until 1992. It was 20 years previously that it was um, declassified in America. Some of the causes for homosexuality have been arrested development, it's a phase, you're immature, it's your parents fault, your father was too distant, your mother too close. We can help you change. There are still, still people practicing in Britain today, therapists, Christian therapists, who conduct um, conversion, so-called conversion therapy. Thankfully, some of the strategies, the mental health, um, suicide prevention strategies, have begun to acknowledge the high levels of mental health problems amongst LGBTs. But this has only just been included and it's hardly got into practice yet. The one area where there's been phenomenal change is law. Until recently, the age of consent, it was illegal for gay men under 21 and then under 18. Lesbians were visible, when it, sorry, were invisible. So that wasn't changed until 2001. In 2003, section 28 of the Local Authority Act um, which called for no promotion of homosexuality within education, within schools, was repealed. In 2003, the Employment Sexual Orientation Regulations came into force, which made it illegal to discriminate against people in employment on the basis of their sexual orientation. In 2005, the Civil Partnership Act was introduced whereby LGBT people could undergo a civil partnership. In 2007, the Goods and Services Act was brought in, which was meant to ensure that goods and services people providing services like bed and breakfast or local services, social services, youth service, schools, etc. Um, that they should not discriminate against LGBT people. In 2008, the Criminal and Justice and Immigration Act included a section called Incitement to Hatred Based on Sexual Orientation. So if somebody was pro proven that they committed a crime and it was clear that that was homophobic, then they would get extra sentencing. And then in 2010, the Equality Act became law, and part of that is a public duty on local authority services and on services in general to promote equality and challenge homophobia. And of course, there's been the recent debate that's going through the House of Lords at the moment on uh, same-sex marriage. Media. It's entertainment. LGBT people used to be invisible or negative images of perverts, pansies, predatory. In fact, you still see occasionally um, the odd stereotype. More recently, there's been a, a leading towards sensationalised lesbians and gays. So you see a lot more lip lipstick lesbians and a lot of lesbians in pornography. That's been there forever. Um, and a lot of camp gay men. 
we are thankfully beginning to get a much more balanced view, um, particularly in dramas, but there's still homophobic reporting, particularly on the BBC. What this reporting does, it allows homophobes to spread their hatred and ignorance in the so-called interest of a balanced argument. Just see, for example, the recent debates on same-sex marriage and how different newspapers have reported that, and in particular how the BBC have reported it. Education, it's invisible. Issues about being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender are usually omitted from the curricula, apart from when they're included in discussions regarding HIV, AIDS. There are very few visible out teachers who can act as role models. You're more likely to get people that are out in areas like London, Manchester, Brighton, um, in more rural areas, small towns, you're much less likely to get out teachers. Virtually every school in Britain experiences, not experiences, there's homophobic bullying in virtually every school in Britain. There are one or two, a handful of schools that are doing something about it, but the majority aren't. There's very little books and little information. And what all that does is to create the homophobes of the future. It's given a clear message to young people that you can continue using homophobic language, you can continue bullying, you won't get punished. Family. It's heterosexual. We are all brought up to be heterosexual and we're brought up with our parents' views, which are often, not always, but often negative negative about homosexuality that is. There's often no support when it's most needed when young people are coming out. Some parents disown the children and don't want to know. Something like 10% of parents reject the children and about 10% respond in a very positive way. The vast majority, 80%, begin by shock, horror, tears, don't tell your father, don't tell your grandma, it'll kill her. Um, not a very positive way to respond. Session two is then concluded with a 13 minute compilation of extracts from television. Today signed copies of his 180 page statement supporting absolute moral values and denouncing theologians who say morals are a matter of individual preference. The Pope speaks of a crisis in Catholic theology. He says it's no longer a matter of limited dissent but of a systematic calling into question of traditional moral doctrine. He says modern arguments can't be used to justify contraception, sterilization, autoeroticism or masturbation premarital sex, homosexual relations and artificial insemination, things which remain intrinsically evil. And just individual texts or anything, but anybody reading the Bible can see that what is commended in the Bible is a relationship between a man and a woman endorsed by Jesus as a lifelong commitment between the two. And anything else is seen as some sort of aberration uh, from that. The Church of England has decided not to bar homosexuals from the priesthood, but the General Synod, that's the Church's Parliament, has agreed by an overwhelming majority that homosexual acts are wrong. People who call themselves gay Christians are undermining the central message of the Christian Gospel. We must help them to see the error of their ways and unashamedly proclaim biblical beliefs and morals. We are in no position to cast stones in this earthly tabernacle of Christ's kingdom, there are many mansions, and all of them are made of glass.
Leviticus is the Old Testament's purity code. It deals with many areas, the ritual slaughter of animals, the impurity of menstruating women, the exclusion of cripples from the priesthood. These are just a few. In Levitican law, the punishment for sodomy is death. No churchman today would seriously advocate the death penalty, but it hasn't always been so. In the 19th century, the church gave its full backing to anti-homosexual legislation. It's extraordinary to think that in 1806 in London, more death sentences were carried out for sodomy than for murder. And even today, many people are jailed each year for homosexual offences. The words in Leviticus, which are so widely quoted by those who are against homosexual practice, and which were used to justify executing homosexuals in the last century, read as follows. If a man has intercourse with a man, as with a woman, they both commit an abomination. They shall both be put to death. Their blood shall be on their own heads. Saunders was released from custody by the appeal court, having had her two six-year sentences for indecent assault reduced to two years probation. She had been found guilty of having sex with two girls while masquerading as a boy. The prosecution said that that was consent that was um, really brought about by fraud and so she had committed an offence. There was an additional and subsidiary reason, which was that one of the young women was in fact 15 and you can't give consent to um, any uh, overt sexual activity at that age. Tumut at police station said I'd uh, had sexual intercourse with these two girls and pretending I were a boy. And I turned and I said, that can you pretend you're a boy and have sex with somebody and not know the difference? I feel it highly unlikely that a prison sentence would ever be imposed uh, where there was consent, where it's a boy and girl of much the same age. Indeed, I would be amazed, really, if the case ever came to court at all. When I went to court, I didn't think, no, I, I thought they'll not find me guilty. I get not guilty. But when I got guilty and they gave me six years, I don't, it didn't hit me until about two months after. That then raises the interesting question as to whether or not uh, the spectre, as it were, of lesbianism has in any way um, featured centrally in the decision to prosecute. And I have to say that apart from the strictly legalistic issue that one of the young girls was um, under 16, my view is that um, society's attitudes towards lesbianism and same-sex um, sexual relations is really at the heart of this case, if one looks at it realistically and from a sensible point of view. When I got found guilty, when Judge, Judge Crabtree was summing up, he uh, went on with his long story about me and he says that I'm living a perverted life, uh, I've got no conscience, no feelings, and I'm just cold-hearted, and them two girls would have rather been raped by men. During the 1960s and 70s, psychologists tried to cure homosexuality with electric shock therapy. Their patients were highly motivated gay men who were deeply unhappy about being homosexual. Once hooked up to the electrode, they were made to watch a mixture of slides, some arousing to straight men, some to gays. The subject moved the series along with a touch on a button. If he lingered too long on any slide, the machine delivered an electric shock. This whole practice has now been completely abandoned. like a freak. I felt a failure. Um, I felt a failure to my parents, to my friends, and I felt suicidal. I just, there was no point in going on. I was abnormal. The treatment consisted of counselling, which went into deep-seated reasons as to why I was gay. I underwent hormonal treatment to try and alter and decrease the percentage of male hormone that was um, supposedly in my body. They put slides and pictures of naked men on the wall 
and I was hypnotised and told bluntly that this is what I wanted, sexual intercourse. It can't be cured. It's it's within, it's, in, it's embodied in your soul. It's not something that can be just taken away. My mother said while she was pregnant, was convinced that I was going to be a boy, a bouncing baby boy, and I was a bouncing baby girl. <laughs> when I was younger, um, I used to play with the boys, football, cowboys and Indians. I did not have a Wendy house. I had Action Man. I wasn't heavily into makeup as I grew up, and. I was comfortable in trousers, and these are all things um, that you think, oh, maybe I should have been a man. Sometimes, regarding my sexuality, I feel very strong about how I feel and that I love women. But then I find myself going back to when I was at home, the periods before going into the mental hospital and during, and I find myself looking in the mirror and asking, is there a reason? If I had a choice of being heterosexual or gay, I'd definitely choose being gay. I'm wow. happy. I'm happy as a stomping dyke, basically. I'm much more happier. I love women, so that's it. I wouldn't change for the world. It has been reignited by the appearance in the last few weeks on Top of the Pops of Shabba Ranks, a superstar of Jamaican music. If you do not love your lover proper, then I'll be jumping through your window. Ranks has become notorious recently for his extreme views on homosexuality. He went so far as to say on a Channel 4 pop programme that gays deserve to be crucified. To the fury of gay and lesbian rights groups, Ranks has twice appeared on top of the pops since making his ill-considered remarks. The BBC is irresponsible to promote the image and influence of such a man, they say. It's colluding with homophobia. The Dorado's brought us Freddie and Xavier. I shouldn't have come. I'll go. Wait. But this time the criticism comes from the gays themselves. The characters are negative, they say. Freddie is a miserable, isolated figure. Xavier was closet. He couldn't come to terms with his sexuality. No. Not today, Freddie. Negative, too, are camp comedy characters such as Mr. Humphreys in Grace and Favour and the constant innuendo in the script. Negative, too, say gay people who've rung in have been birds of a feather who've alluded to poofs and Nancy boys. <laughs> Because Richard is a sensitive, nicely spoken 17 year old poofter. <laughs> in Casualty, which featured the gang rape of a rent boy. The idea of boyfriends and girlfriends as the, as the natural way to be, well, it never expressed a reality to me. It's something I was up against all the time watching the telly or reading any book, and it just said this is the way to be, and it just didn't ring true to me. I didn't find any information at all from being at school about being lesbian or gay. As I said, it, it just wasn't an option. There was no positive images, there was no negative images. It was very invisible. And if anyone did make a, an off-the-cuff remark, it would be derogatory. I did come out to people at school, and um, the people in my class were very good about it, and they still are. It's a mixture of people being um, friends with me and it's a mixture of people shouting at me and calling me names and being nasty towards me. Uh, when people are nasty to me, I think that it's their problem that they're so close-minded and it's not mine. I think teachers have um, a big role to play to make lesbians and gay men feel safe. If the lesbians and gay men don't feel they will get a good response from home, then the next place you should go to is your school. And if you don't get a good reaction from school, you wouldn't know where to go. Sure. I've always known that my mum hated gays, so I knew I was really oh, prepared. Oh, no. That's, no it was... that's too strong a word, darling. I didn't hate them. Well, you didn't like them. I didn't them. understand them. You didn't them. understand them. I mean, because there was a time when, as I said, I was watching television and there was a, it was a programme on another channel. I don't know what it was, but um, they was talking about homosexuals and my mum and dad blurted out and said that... Um, 
they all should put um, homosexuals on an island and shoot them. And I, I don't was... remember the shooting bit, but oh, I did say they should be put on an island. Yeah, I do I mean, remember that. I was sitting in front of the television and they couldn't see me, but I was sitting there crying. So in a way, I knew she was going to be like really upset and distraught and, my God, you know, get away from me. Who are you and whatever. I think I'm the only Asian person here in this whole audience and the issue of culture and identity hasn't come up. For Asian people, the issue of coming out is very, very different. I'm very lucky. My mother knew since I was 13, no problems, because she knew gay people in Calcutta. But here, for an Asian person to come out, not only are they exposing themselves to their own family, to their own immediate family, they are becoming very visible to the whole community. So the risks tend to be much larger and more difficult. So that's why you won't find any more Asian people here. One behind you. <laughs> well, it's well, not, I think he's Greek, he's Greek, he's Greek, he's Greek. <laughs> I mean, it's really difficult, yeah. but I mean... Um, a different culture again. A different, different culture, completely. And a macho, ma Greek's a macho, you see? <laughs> <laughs> no, but is that part of the well, 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 Exactly, is that part of the problem too? The diff I mean... Yeah, we, I mean, my father wanted me to be um, strong, macho, you know, be the man, you're the breadwinner, that sort of thing, but... It's uh, a bit different for, the, for, for our cultures. The issue is not so much being macho, the issue living in this country as a, as a major minority community we are concerned about our relationship to the host community. So yeah. often the discussion around sexuality is just non-existent. You can't go up to your parents and yeah. talk about your sexuality. Yeah. You just can't. I mean, as Tony was saying, um, I think it's really difficult when um, a third party tells your parents. Mm -hmm. um, my cousin outed me. I didn't have the privilege to tell my parents I'm gay. Um, when I told my cousin, she was on the phone to my parents who live in Greece. Um, told him I was gay, so I was having transatlantic arguments with my parents. Um, which is not the way to conduct which an Which is argument. not the way. She took, I mean, she took That's away the privilege as well of yeah. me coming out yeah. and facing my parents. Um, then uh, she threw me out onto the streets.